Well, welcome to SuperCloud 3. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE here in Palo Alto for our third edition of SuperCloud. This is where security and AI meet together for the SuperCloud. Hottest topic in AI is security and data. We're here for a keynote fireside chat with Kit Colbert, VMware CTO. Kit, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Well, thanks for having me again. You've been uh, being leader in the cross-cloud, super-cloud, multi-cloud effort for VMware in the industry. Lots mm -hmm. changed since super-cloud one. Yep. A lot more visibility on this layer, this interaction. Multi-cloud, much more used term with more meat on the bone, so to speak. Cross-cloud has been getting a lot of traction, so congratulations mm -hmm. on then. But now as it goes to the next level, you're seeing Gen AI enter the scene, which is bringing up the conversation of automation, you got Code Whisper from AWS, you got Copilot, people are writing code, starting to see a lot more action on the dev side, yeah. impacting the operational aspect of data. Yep. This is a huge thing, there's a lot of hype in, in Gen AI. What are you hearing? Yeah, well, <clears throat> a couple of things. So uh, I think you're right, it's been uh, not quite a year since our, our first SuperCloud event, uh, which I really think helped us set the stage across the industry and, and start the conversation uh, that we're continuing now. Um, and I think your point is, is accurate that we, we have seen uh, the industry coalesce around this concept that there's a certain architecture that you need to adopt in order to be successful in this multi-cloud era that we're in. And I think what's interesting is that you know, ever since ChatGPT came out in November of last year, tremendous interest that we've seen across the industry. I mean, this was you know, a, very much like an iPhone moment. You, know, you saw it and you can never sort of unsee it. You can never go back to the way things were before. <clears throat> and so I think what we're seeing across the board is every company trying to figure out, okay, how do I uh, realize the value of generative AI? And how do I do so without necessarily falling into some of the same traps that I've fallen into before when the previous super hot technology came out, right? And so, so I do think that we have this interesting coalescing of this cross-cloud or multi-cloud architecture with generative AI. You know, it's interesting, VMware, if you go back to the roots of VMware, it was a disruptive technology, came out of nowhere, virtual machines, that created a market. Mm -hmm. Amazon with cloud, they created cloud computing. And now generative AI has got its own market. Each of these inflection points have the same par parameters. A lot of developer action, yep. operational impact, meaning changing the game of how companies work. Yep. And so now we're in this mode where cloud's gone to edge gen AI at scale. You got two types of profile customers the startups or developers, and then the enterprises that are already out there. Yep. So you have people going to reuse Gen AI for their existing stuff mm -hmm. and net new capabilities. So yep. you're kind of changing the airplane at 35,000 feet <laughs> if you're an existing player, yep. and then you get the new entrants coming in. So it's an interesting dynamic. How does Gen AI get valued in terms of uh, the person looking at a startup clear, yeah. We have to an opportunity, yep. but for a big company. Yeah. How do you tackle this? <clears throat> you got to integrate it in, you got to see some low hanging fruit. What's yep. the playbook? How do you see this creating value? Well, I think it's a great point because what you see is with something like Gen AI, uh, Gen AI, given the importance of it, it really creates an inflection point for the industry. And I think when you find these inflection points happening uh, in the history of business, what you see is it does provide tremendous opportunities for these startups to sort of get in with uh, a, a very different, or potentially you could argue better, value proposition. And so, I think for a lot of established enterprises, what they're starting to think about is like, okay, <clears throat> I thought, you know, I, I have a, a solid moat, you might think, but how could that get disrupted by this new Gen AI technology? And how can I, as an established enterprise, think about how to defend against some of these startups coming in there? So. I think everyone realizes there's huge potential. I think there's still a lot of discovery happening around how to best realize that potential. And I think the other thing <clears throat> that I hear a lot of concern about from large enterprises is on the security side of this. I want to go in, I want to move quickly to take advantage of this technology, but how do I also ensure that I'm not um, driving greater risk or damaging myself in, the, in that way, right? Like, uh, am I potentially leaking proprietary data from leveraging Gen AI? Am I uh, potentially uh, doing some sort of I IP contamination uh, through the output of, the, of these Gen AI systems? So some of these things are unknown at this point. So I do see both the excitement as well as the risk management side of it and folks trying to balance those two things. And you see companies like Amazon, for instance, doing the bedrock, they have the licensing mm -hmm. guarantee with the Titan models. Yep. They also have the ability to do training and EC GP GPU clusters. So there's costs associated with doing it mm -hmm. is one. 
the question I want to ask you is how does that relate to super cloud? Because remember, super cloud and multi cloud is kind of coming the same, coming together. Yep. Is AI going to help in the short term push us forward operationally towards super cloud? That's a really good question. <clears throat> I think it's going to be one of those things where I can see it going both ways. <laughs> you saw my smirk, right? I can, <laughs> I can make arguments in both directions. Um, <clears throat> you know, typically what you find is that when folks see a new technology like Gen AI, what we're seeing now, they're sort of going all in. They're not necessarily thinking about what comes next. They're saying, hey, I just need to get this thing solved, get something in production, start realizing business value from it. But then typically what they find is that, oh, I've kind of painted myself into a bit of a corner. It's in, in, inhibiting my ability to scale, my ability to really take advantage, let's say in this case of multi-cloud. So I do see some thoughtfulness going into the, these discussions. People are thinking about, okay, what sort of architecture should I be taking here? What sort of dependencies should I be taking and on whom? And how do I ensure that I still get the sort of choice of location that's super important? So like just as another quick data point, a lot, a lot of large enterprises definitely using public cloud for Gen AI, but at the same time, they want to know they have a path back to on-prem. It's actually really, really interesting, um, both uh, for things like, can I do it more effectively, or cost efficiently on-prem, but also from a security and risk standpoint that I mentioned before as well. So there's definitely a lot of thought going in there, and I think the jury's still yeah. out on how it will unfold. You know, I, I hear two schools of thought on one hand. Democratization, that's Databricks' big message, mm -hmm. you know, making it development. Obviously, open source is driving a lot of value. I'm not going to poo-poo that. It's a, it's a great message. No, I think it's, I think it's amazing how, how fast the open source community is moving on this and how, uh, how fast it's evolving fundamentally. Yeah, and I think that's going to be where the, where the canary in the coal mine will come from. I think that's mm -hmm. the, act, the answer. And then on the other hand, I hear a lot of people saying, it's not that easy, and it's not. There's some technical challenges to get AI into the cloud and then bring in the scale for, for hybrid and then mm -hmm. obviously super cloud. Mm -hmm. And so I have to ask you, is there, or do you see this thinking, do you see the trend being more solution architecture? Because the, the, the conversation I'm getting into are on, on that hand is, is that, it feels like the solution architect conversation is from years ago. It's like, okay, how do we lay it out? Yep. So there's a lot more yep. holistic systems thinking into the Gen AI than just saying, okay, yeah, just spin up some servers and let's get some GPUs. Yep. That's a dev rel, that's a dev test, kind of like a more of a mm -hmm. sandbox. But once you want to put something into production, I see a lot more conversations that are serious around architecture, yep. playbook, yep. privacy, compliance and governance, kind of foundationally setting that layer and then enabling that value. What's your thoughts on yeah. the whole conversation? Well, I think it goes back to your previous point, which is that you see some folks sort of rushing headlong, not necessarily thinking about that broader architecture discussion, whereas, whereas you have other folks that are thinking very much about it. <clears throat> and I think one of the amazing things that's, I mean, how long has it been? Seven, eight months since ChatGPT sort of came on the scene and, and caught everyone by, by surprise. Um, but what you're seeing very quickly is this evolution of what the right sort of reference architecture looks like for a gen AI or large language model type of system. And you're starting to see all, you know, just an explosion of startups in the space. And so these people are starting to come in. And I think the key thing, kind of like we've been talking about with a cross-cloud architecture, is how do you ensure that, that reference architecture is fundamentally cross-cloud in nature? I think <clears throat> what you find, and what we found at least from other domains, like traditional cloud native apps, if you will, um, like you know, Kubernetes, is that it doesn't actually take that much more effort to make it cross-cloud. You just have to plan ahead a little bit, right? And to really be thoughtful around the dependencies on the APIs, et cetera, that you take. So that's really the, um, the, the direction it's going. And that, as I said, gives me some confidence that we can actually approach and take advantage of Gen AI while also ensuring that people have the flexibility and choice that comes with multi-cloud. I want to get your thoughts on, um, is AI a next-gen workload or is it a bolt-on feature natively in the application? So I can see it going both ways. Yeah. It's kind of a depends question, but how do yeah. you see that playing out? Because AI, quote, workloads might be a big thing coming forward. Yeah, no, I, so I think they are really a next-gen workload. It's, it's not just a bolt-on to, let's say, you know, anything else you do with Kubernetes, right? Clearly you can build an AI large language model on top of Kubernetes, and you should, it's great, right? <clears throat> but the thing is there's so much additional specialization that's needed there, right? You look at things like prompt engineering or, or things like vector databases, like all the tooling that goes around that, that's all highly specialized. And so <clears throat> I look at it as a new type of application, and I think because of the scale that you're going to see, the fact that you're going to see AI or large language model based apps being like a quarter, maybe even a third 
of the application portfolio for many companies in, let's say, three to five years, that it, you do need to treat it as its own type of app and really get a lot of specialization around supporting it. What's VMware's view? I know you guys do a lot of R&D in, mm -hmm. in data and AI. You, operationally, you guys have a great client base. Yep. They're all looking at this future cloud, super cloud, cross cloud, as that next gen VMware, VMware Explore world yeah. Yeah. that's emerging. And, and it's going to look kind of the same, but different. You're going to have more microservices. You mentioned Kubernetes, but now you got the notion of a changing data infrastructure to support Gen AI, yep. that's infrastructure. Yep. This data products layer, I call it's emerging, where data is the products. Yep. I mean, LLMs could be, you know, VMware could have their own LLM, right? So, <laughs> you know, who knows? Everyone's going to have their own large language models and yeah. foundational models. Yeah. And then you got the developer. Yep. At the end of the day yep. is coding. Mm -hmm. How do you see that threading together? Infrastructure, yeah, data question. products, and data developer, I call it. <clears throat> so here, here's what I'll say, um, kind of give you a little bit of a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about at, at Explore, uh, but of course not, <laughs> not give away too much here. <laughs> but uh, the general point of view, uh, you know, as I mentioned, is that we do see the Gen AI and large language model space as a new type of application. And yet at the same time, and while, uh, while it does require some new sets of capabilities that we just talked about. At the same time, it does leverage a lot of the existing things that are already out there, right? You need infrastructure, right? You need infrastru infrastructure that's optimized for these sort of applications. You need to, how do you manage your costs across all these locations? How do you do governance and automation? Uh, how do you do security, right? Networking, networking is a huge thing, especially high speed networking for these sorts of apps. So a lot of our current product portfolio, we believe we can bring to bear uh, to support customers doing large language models. But we want to do that, of course, across cloud. But I think it, what a, a big focus for us starting off is, how do we create a simple turnkey solution uh, for on-premises environments? Because um, again, this is one thing we hear from customers and we hear that there aren't good, simple, cost-effective solutions there. So you're going to see a big focus from us there. You know, one of the things we talked about when we talked about hybrid and edge was you move your compute to the data. Mm -hmm. With cross cloud and super cloud, the conversation shifts to move your workload to the data. Yep. Because now data is much more yep. um, agile, much more programmable, mm -hmm. if you get a lot of the stuff done in the foundation layer. Federated um, catalogs, I've heard is big topic. Data fabrics, yep. um, horizontally scalable infrastructure to keep track of the check boxes, the compliance and the governance. Mm -hmm. Once that's kind of set up, another layer emerges to handle the data that yep. needs to be available yep. for applications for the AI to work. Because remember, AI is only as good as the data, right. not just right. the software anymore. Well, I think, and this is, I think, a key part of our perspective, is, which is that your data is sort of spread out all around. I mean, you certainly have some of the data center, some of the public cloud, but a lot of the data that's getting created or will get created over the next few years is going to be out at the edge. And so that's another big focus for us, or a reason for our focus on-prem is this notion that we want to, in your words, like bring the workload, bring the infrastructure to where the data is. And so we're trying to support customers to give them that flexibility to say, okay, <clears throat> where do I want, maybe I build a model and even train it perhaps yeah. in one place, but where am I actually going to serve it? Where am I running inference? Where am I bring in in context information? Maybe that's at, out at the edge. And so I think having that sort of flexibility is key. The second point, you talk about data. And you know, we've been doing a lot of different uh, things in the data space mm -hmm. for a while. And um, you know, one of the new initiatives we have, this notion of what we call a data services manager. And the exact point there is to provide better flexibility to customers around data to help them uh, provide access to their different data sources in a more dynamic way. You mentioned VMware Explosive coming up and you didn't want to reveal too much. I got the sense <laughs> there's going to be some gen of AI discussion in there, large language and foundation models. Yep. Makes a lot of sense because the developers and the operators are going frenzy over this stuff. It's going mm -hmm. crazy and it's legit. It's a little hyped up right now, but people <laughs> are sinking their teeth into it and it's, it's much more of a sustainable trend yeah. as say a uh, hyped up, you know, quick turn, uh, hyped up market. Or like something like, you know, you look at blockchain or web three, which I think do have a lot of applications but may have been a bit overhyped compared to what they can yeah, do. Th there versus, wasn't enough reality there. Right, gettable. actual use cases. I think the long game will prove that will work, I mm -hmm. think. But here, AI is impacting immediately. Yeah. There's low hanging fruit yeah, out there. Absolutely. Uh, configuration, even from a developer productivity standpoint. Developer productivity, I mean, the other big one we hear about <clears throat> is how do you provide a large language model to support your customer service representatives. So that if a customer calls in with questions, these folks can very quickly search the knowledge base, figure out what they need yeah. to, get an answer, get a quicker time to value. 
you know, we see a lot of it also on the, you know, whether it's marketing or social, creating copy there. Yeah. So there's a lot of these use cases and they're, you know, effective and, and you know, it'll be leveraged today. And data is distributed. We're going to see a lot more distributed computing paradigms coming in. Yeah. I want to get your thoughts on this because um, on this super cloud event this year, this this uh, episode three, we got a lot of inbound. We put a speak call for speakers uh, mm -hmm. page out there, and we got a lot of people from the VMUG and VMware ecosystem who wanted to submit talks. Okay. So it's clearly resonating with your customer base. Yep. This is a, a a VMware direction that you're taking that has another ten to twenty year horizon. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm seeing your ecosystem responding to that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the VMs was a great run, it's continuing to be relevant, <laughs> but there's almost mm -hmm. another 20 mile stare out there in the, in the yeah. industry where people can see a career path, operating yeah. networks and operating data like they were with vSphere. So like there's a yeah. whole nother yeah. level of career path where people are going to start to settle in and that's been a huge, you know, it's been a huge focus for us. So, you know, we have, I don't even know how many actually VMware administrators are out there. I would guess in the high hundreds of thousands to small number of you know, millions. But, um, you know, a big focus for us is how do we help them to take forward that skill set? You know, there's a lot of work we did, for instance, with deeply integrating Kubernetes with vSphere. So you have that same sort of management model there in vCenter, but you can now ex extend that to these cloud native applications or applications that have been containerized. And we want to continue to, to drive that forward with AI-based and Gen AI-based applications yeah. as well. And I think you know the other the corollary there is not just within vSphere itself, but across all of our product portfolio yeah. as we go to this cross-cloud architecture, really helping them to expand their uh, their skill set to support this very dynamic environment. Yeah. And they're and they're the operators of the networks of, of the environments with computing. I think the aperture of operations mm -hmm. is interesting. You know, DevOps started it, then it's DevSecOps security. Yeah. <laughs> the next question is when is it DevSec data ops? Right. And right. so we're seeing data kind of weave in the similar pattern to security. Mm -hmm. Shifting left became huge wave yep. of value because yep. now developers can be at the point of coding, embedding security policies that are given yep. to them as guardrails from ops. Exactly. And that's exactly. more efficiency, developer yep. productivity, better supply chain Reduces security. Risk. Now yep. the data question is, does that look the same to you for Absolutely. data? Absolutely, has to be. I, I think it's uh, unquestionable. <clears throat> so the, you know, the reality is when we're talking about data, in some ways, you're getting into even bigger risks for a company. Uh, as you know, there's all sorts of compliance, and regulatory requirements across many different businesses and many different industries, right? I mean, of course, there's a highly regulated ones like banks, uh, healthcare, but you know, across any of them, if you're dealing with things like payment information or personal identifiable information, these sorts of things become really, really critical. And so <clears throat> while you may want to say, hey, let's go a bit fast and loose, get something out there in, uh, in the J uh, Gen AI or LLM space, the reality is if you're not really thoughtful about what data you're using to train the model, mm -hmm or where that data has come from, uh, as well as <clears throat> the impacts of what data you're putting into the model, yeah. then it can have huge repercussions uh, from a risk standpoint. Bill Walsh, the famous uh, football coach, was asked why he was so successful. He said, you know, I just controlled the inputs and let the scoreboard take care of itself. He had, <laughs> you know, Joe Montana, Jerry Rice. Yep. You're yep. controlling the inputs are critical QA with anything. And then football example, obviously the yep. talent drives the score, data drives the value. This is becoming another operational linchpin mm -hmm. to distributed computing. Yep. As a CTO, I'm sure you agree, but as other CTOs out there and other data architects or data engineering, whatever we call them, they're going to be thinking about this problem. What's your advice as super cloud continues to push, cross cloud continues to push, yep. this multi-cloud phenomenon, multi-vendor, mm -hmm. it's going to look different. What's yep. the advice to CTOs out there in solution architects? Well, here's what we're trying to do, <clears throat> I think. you know, Because by the way, we are both um, a producer of software to support customers and companies doing Gen AI, but we are also doing it ourselves internally, right? So we're also learning these lessons as I think the rest of the industry does. And so I think a key point that we talked about earlier is developing those guardrails, having really clear policies. You know, We've got um, uh, kind of a one pager that we put out for everyone internally around what are uh, responsible use uh, guidelines for Gen AI. Not to mention our ethical guidelines. Like We've got pretty high standards around that. Yeah. <clears throat> so things like, on the ethics side, tra explainability, transparency, uh, fairness, trying to reduce you know, bias, these sorts of things. But on the responsible use as well, being really thoughtful about what data goes in, uh, what sort of systems we can or cannot use, et cetera, et cetera. So I think 
part of that, getting back to your inputs you know, concept, is kind of defining that sandbox, saying, okay, here's the, the guardrails. You kind of play, go ahead and play inside of that. That's fine, <laughs> you know, have at it. <clears throat> but we also need to make sure that we protect the company appropriately. And so I think that's what it comes back to. How do you ensure that you're protecting the company appropriately while at the same time enabling your developers, employees to go as fast as they can within that framework? You got different needs for consumption, you got cloud as enabler, mm -hmm. and you got enterprise needs. This is going to be interesting. I mean, all that so, coming together yep. and with the developers leading the charge, I've never seen anything more exciting than something developer led right now. And you're seeing yep. the same movement when SaaS started with cloud. That was clearly a step function from a startup trying to provision a data center, buy a box and then test everything. Get in your PC, put it on the cloud, put your credit card down, you're the next Dropbox Airbnb. Yep. There are new brands that are going to emerge. Mm -hmm. This is a big wave. Yep. What, what are some of the things that you might see out there? Just from Kit's perspective, put the Kit Colbert CTO <laughs> hat on, looking out of the landscape, what, yeah, might, I, what might emerge that might, no one might see? I think it's, I mean, just kind of some wild stuff uh, that's coming out. Like some of the things I've heard about recently, I don't even know the names of some of these companies, but like there's one that will just connect onto a Zoom call and listens to your meeting as you're you know, having a meeting with colleagues. And then it, what it does is it takes a transcript and summarizes it you know, creates bullets you know, for action items and all that and sends it out, right? And so like, these are like really small ways in which work is going to get automated and where I think we can create um, a better work environment and, and to be more efficient. But you know, honestly, some of the biggest transformations and, and so forth that are going to happen will be surprises, things that we can't even think of. And so I think that's really what goes back to what we are talking about before is like to some degree, like I, as a CTO, I've got a bunch of ideas, but I'm not necessarily on the ground in the trenches, yeah. you know, doing the, the, the job of you know, coding day to day or answering customer service queries. And so part of it is how do you enable those folks yeah. uh, to see a problem and say, you know what, maybe there's a large language model that might be able to solve this. You know, it's an opportunity recognition, you nailed it. It's a human AI relationship. And then ultimately it's like the constraints and the solution, putting it together, yep. all coming together. This is kind of a Cambrian explosion. Absolutely. It's going to take VMware to the next level. Looking forward to seeing you <laughs> explore. Yeah. Thanks for coming on SuperCloud uh, 3. Oh, thanks for having me. All right, Kit Colbert here, Fireside Chat keynote here. SuperCloud 3, Security AI Meet. This is the next generation cloud connecting everything together. Humans plus AI is better than AI. A lot of constraints and solutions available, but you got to figure out which models, how you're going to build these apps. These are new workloads, major impact to cloud operations. This is SuperCloud 3. Thanks for watching.